Uh, hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon uh, for our Talks with Tutors session. Um, my name is Amy. I'm one of the Access and Outreach Officers at Morgan College. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, to introduce you to um, Jenny Castle, who is going to be giving you your talk today. Um, I'm going to hand over to her. She's going to give a presentation for about 40 minutes and we'll have 20 minutes at the end for questions. So do just pop them in the Teams chat um, and we'll get to them at the end. And they could be on anything to do with things you've heard in the presentation, questions you might have um, about studying at Oxford and Oxford life, anything like that. Um, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, so, yes, I'm very pleased to hand over to uh, Jenny. Thank you. Um, hello all and welcome. Uh, so as Amy said, my name is Jenny and I'm one of the economics tutors at Magdalen College. Um, there are two of us, uh, two eco uh, economists at the college, and we teach students for economics through the degree PPE, which is politics, philosophy and economics. Um, there are two um, courses that you can take with economics at Oxford, PPE and economics and management, but at Magdalen College we don't offer economics and management. So if that's a course that you're interested in, it's a great course, but uh, have a look at the colleges that do offer economics and management. Um, at Magdalen though, we've got a, a large number of um, politics, philosophy and economics tutors, and it's a, a great course um, to take. So for economics, um, many of you may be studying economics at A-level, um, if you're not, don't worry. If you're still interested in economics, you don't have to have taken economics to study politics, philosophy and economics. Um, but you're probably used to questions like um, looking at demand and supply or allocation of scarce resources. All of these kind of what I would think of as rather dull um, topics in economics. But economics is much broader than that. Um, the, in fact, the economics that we study at Oxford uh, is designed to give you a, a broad set of tools or skill sets that can be used in very many different disciplines and all walks of life. And in fact, my own research is in economic forecasting. And so when Amy asked uh, me to talk a bit about um, something to do with economics, I thought I'd talk to you about my research interests, which is economic forecasting, to give you an idea that economics can be a bit broader than maybe what the core syllabus is for your A-levels. Uh, and also, it's quite topical. Um, given that we're living through uh, a, a pandemic with um, enormous implications for uh, the economics um, uh, and the economic world, then forecasting is really very important. And so we'll uh, we'll talk a bit about that. So let me start by sharing my screen. I'm going to use some slides. Um, and hopefully you can all see this. Uh, where do I want view full screen though? OK. So I'll get started talking about can economists forecast the future? So you must have made a forecast when you decided to log on to Teams for this outreach session today. Uh, and by forecasting, you must have been thinking about whether you'll find this session interesting, whether you may learn anything of any use, whether your time would be much better spent gaming or on Snapchat or playing football, doing homework, any of these things. So you must have made a forecast. Let's evaluate that forecast at the end of this session to see whether it was indeed uh, interesting or useful or whether you would have been better off spending your time doing something else. But anyway, forecasting is really endemic. We all forecast many things every day, probably quite unconsciously. And a classic example is that taxi drivers go on duty when they forecast customers will hire them. There's really no point in going on duty when there are no customers out there. But forecast errors can be really expensive. And we've seen examples of this, a shortage of ICU capacity for COVID-19 cases, for example, possible bankruptcy for companies if demand and supply are misforecast. Poor growth and inflation forecasts can lead to interest rate moves or quantitative easing policies that are counterproductive, a failure to hedge against exchange rate moves, or indeed probably relating to you, what choice of university should you apply to? And arming yourself with as much information as possible will help you to make an informed forecast. So good forecasting can really pay handsome dividends, but it's riddled pit with pitfalls. And that's what I'll talk about today. Now, there's a lovely analogy here of a car journey. Forecasters have sometimes described their task as similar to driving in a thick fog using only the rearview mirror. 
but that is an understatement. To make the metaphor more exact, add misted windows, an unreliable clutch, a blindfold and handcuffs, not to mention an unsignposted cliff 100 metres down the road. So let's begin our journey. I'm going to use the car journey analogy to try and draw out how economic forecasting is done as we go along. So similar to economic forecasting, let's think about planning a car journey. Let's assume that you're uh, going to, well, after lockdown, you're going to drive to Magdalen College to come and have a look around the college and see if you think it's a nice place and that you'd like to apply there. So you're planning your trip from your home to Magdalen College. So you've decided on your destination and you need to consult a map. Now, you may never have been there before, so you need a, a physical map or you may uh, know where Oxford is and therefore you have a cognitive map in your head. Now, these maps schematically represent space, but otherwise they seriously mislead. The relative scales and colours are all wrong, but it doesn't matter. These maps only need to portray the genuine connections. In other words, what roads you need to take to get to Magdalen College. And that analogy is good to think of in terms of the econometric model. So an economic model is an equivalent of a road map. What it's doing is embodying the best knowledge of all, our, of all the linkages in the economy. So we use it to try and get a measure of what's going on in the economy. But clearly it's only a schematic representation and it can seriously mislead. So if we were to evaluate the map of your journey from your home to, to Magdalen College, there's going to be many factors that determine the journey time. So you're interested in forecasting how long it'll take you to get to Magdalen. And these factors could include the distance, the road quality, type of vehicle, driver's skill and their personality, the traffic density, time of day, weather, all of these things will enter into your forecast of how long it'll take you to undertake the journey. And when we think about an econometric model, exactly the same principles occur, but it's not so easy to evaluate these econometric models in practice. So given all of these factors, we try and estimate the trip's duration. And hopefully it's sufficiently accurate so that you get to your destination on time. But lots of things can occur on that journey and there's lots of causes of variation around the estimate. So let's assume that you think it'll take you three hours uh, to get from your house to Magdalen College. So you predict three hours, but there could be many events that occur en route. So let's say you're caught by a sequence of red traffic lights or there's heavier traffic than expected and so on. So actually it could take you a bit longer or indeed you may get caught by a sequence of green traffic lights and it may take you a bit shorter. So that is variability around that journey time. And we measure that by the standard deviation. So I've got here a, a, a normal distribution. The mean is zero. So we're saying that's your average journey time. So let's say that's three hours to get from your house to Magdalen. But it may take you two and a half hours or it may take you three and a half hours. Um, and if that's one standard deviation, there's a 68 percent probability that you will get to Magdalen within two and a half to three and a half hours. So we can express our uncertainty about our forecast um, using a distribution like this. Now, if that uncertainty is very large, let's say it's 50 percent, that's a very unreliable route that could be between an hour and a half and four and a half hours. That's not a very informative forecast. If it's just one percent of your three hours, of course, you're within a couple of minutes either side and motorists would certainly like that. That would ensure prompt arrival. So the uncertainty about forecasts really matters. And you can think about it as being akin to weather forecasts, reporting the probability of rain. You know, what's the chance that it'll rain today? Well, it's very different if it's a 20 percent chance versus a, a, an 80 percent chance of rain. So that's an analogy to think about economic forecasts. A large standard deviation means that your forecasts are pretty unreliable. So let's go pre pandemic era. OK, so GDP growth roughly was about two and a half percent per annum in OECD countries. But a standard deviation around that GDP growth was 3% per annum. OK, so to cover 95% confidence, uh, that's that distribution of the normal distribution, we need to go plus or minus two standard deviations around the mean. That's 2.5% plus or minus 6% to cover the outturn 95% of the time. So if I said to the Bank of England, well, 
I think that GDP is going to be between minus three and a half percent and eight and a half percent next year. That's not a very informative forecast, is it? I don't think they'll be very uh, pleased with that. Um, I don't know whether there's going to be a recession or a huge boom. But actually, it's much more difficult to get smaller intervals uh, in practice. And there are many reasons why. So let's continue our journey to see why it's hard to get these accurate forecasts. Now, there are many unexpected events. You're coming from your house to Maudlin and as you're driving along, you could get a flat tire. You could hit some really bad weather. You could have a car accident. Uh, you could come across a collapsed bridge. All of these events are going to change your forecast of your arrival time. Now, if there's no alternative route, your forecast error is going to be very large. And that car analogy also highlights something that happens a lot in economics that minor surprises, small events can have sudden and very large effects and they can lead to serious delays without what's visibly an extreme event. So, for example, uh, you're driving down the M1 to get to Oxford, for example, and there's some um, some roadworks on there. So the speed limit is 50 rather than 70 miles an hour. If there's moderate traffic, you drive through that road work with no problem. It adds a small bit of additional time to your journey, but not significant. But with slightly denser traffic, you can get horrendous congestion. And we think of those as nonlinearities. There's a regime switch in the model that goes from everything's flowing fairly smoothly to sudden congestion. Gridlock is the most extreme outcome and it's really difficult to forecast. And in economics, we have huge numbers of nonlinearities and regime switches that cause these forecasting failures. So let's go back to this normal distribution. Statistics is really important in economics to try and understand what's going on in the world. We have a normal distribution here. It's the basis for probabilities, for random sampling from a given distribution basis for statistical inference. So here, remember, we're measuring our journey time. We think it's going to take about three hours uh, to get to Magdalen College, but we're a bit uncertain around it, and that's captured by the standard deviation. But what if we faced a distribution like this, the blue one? We call this a fat tail distribution for obvious reasons. You can see in the tails, it goes uh, much further out. And some of you may have read Nicholas Taleb's book about black swans. You may observe a black swan event. For example, you get the flat tire. That's a discrepant event and it's going to result in your journey time being quite significantly longer than what you'd predicted. But in economics, we don't just see black swans. We often see flocks of black swans and you wouldn't get these with independent sampling. So you wouldn't get a string of flat tires you know, 10 journeys in a row, for example. But we see this in economics. And that means that the distribution has shifted. We're now actually in the green distribution. And so, and we call this a location shift. And so actually the average journey time of getting to Magdalen is no longer three hours, but it's four hours, for example, because of a collapsed bridge. And that's a permanent shift until the bridge has been repaired. And that makes forecasting really difficult because if we thought we were in the red distribution or even the blue distribution, we'd get very different forecasts relative to those from the green distribution. And the COVID-19 pandemic is the classic example of that shift in distribution. We're now facing a very different economy to that a year ago. Now we have another problem. OK, so not only are these events coming along and hitting us, flat tires, broken bridges, etc. Our map is wrong. OK, so the journey map that you've got, let's assume that some of the roads shown don't exist uh, and therefore you're going to get serious forecast error if the road suddenly terminates or disappears. And that complicates the calculation of forecast uncertainty. It's not a problem if you don't have to drive down that road, but of course it is if you should be going down that road. And we have exactly the same problem in economics. Not only do we have these shifts in distribution like COVID, but we have the incorrect model. We call that misspecification. We don't know what the true economy looks like. We've got approximations to it, but probably more like mere guesses. But they interact with these location shifts, which really mean forecasting is extremely difficult in economics. So good guides are very sparse when the future is not like the past. And we have a special name for this. Economists call it non-stationarity. It means that the past looks very different to the future. 
and it's a characteristic of all economies. And due to many reasons, the classic is technological progress. I'm sure all of you have got mobile phones. Your parents probably would not have had mobile phones at your age. So that's uh, something that's very different modeling the past to the future. As well as that, we have sudden shifts, legislative, legislative changes and policy regime shifts. Brexit is the classic example here. The uh, economic world in which we face uh, post-Brexit is extremely different to that pre-Brexit. And then we have outside events, wars, pandemics, crises, natural disasters, again, COVID-19. All of these events markedly affect living standards, inflation, etc. So they're hugely important, but they mean forecasting is extremely difficult. And we classify this non-stationarity, this changing behavior over time in two, two um, types, regular persistent changes. And we've got quite a good sense of how to model those and sudden unanticipated large changes. You're probably all too young to remember the financial crisis. It doesn't seem long ago to me, um, but that was a huge shock. Uh, obviously um, now seeming fairly small compared to COVID. Eurozone crisis, Brexit, Trump, all of these events are sudden unanticipated shifts as well. So as I say, the world is vastly different yesterday uh, compared to today change is endemic and we get structural breaks we're going to see many large unanticipated shocks so how on earth do we forecast them so let me do some forecasting first and give you a sense of how we do it so i've been forecasting um covid19 cases and deaths with some colleagues i'll show you the data to start with and let's go right back to the beginning this is in march 2020 and i've got data for the uk us EU and actually Italy as part of the EU, because if you recall back in March last year, Italy was um, one of the first countries in Europe that took off. And you can see this exponential growth in cases and deaths that occurred week on week as we move through uh, March into April. Then if we go towards June and I'll show you this because it highlights some really tricky things to deal with when you're forecasting. First, we've got data revisions. So when data are published, it's a bit uncertain and they're revised over time. We've got seasonality and you might think that's a bit strange, but actually um, the number of cases and deaths aren't reported very accurately over the weekend. And so you see a flattening in the weekend when people are uh, on the weekend and not, not reporting these things. And then suddenly a shooting up again on Mondays uh, when it catches up. We've even got a case here of negative deaths, which is really quite remarkable, um, but that's due to changing definitions. So all of these aspects need to be incorporated into how to forecast the data. And this is what it looks like now up to uh, February 2021. Here I've just plotted it for the UK. Some really uh, major shifts. So my argument before, as I showed you, this shifting distribution, just look at this data. It's shifting all over the place. So we need to be able to forecast this. And here are our forecasts. So these forecasts, I think I made a couple of days ago. Um, these are for cases. Uh, there's a lot of information in this, for, in this graph, so I, I won't go through it in much detail, but um, uh, I think the important thing is that the black line, solid line, which is our average forecast, is really show, showing the slowing down as we're, we're expecting um, as we move forward through the next few weeks. And the same for deaths. That's really slowing down as well. So I'm an economist, but I've been interested in forecasting COVID-19 cases and deaths. Uh, this is not using epidemiological models. Um, quite different but i think economists can bring something of their statistical knowledge to uh, very interesting problems like covid19 and actually these forecasts have been um, used quite widely uh, so oh yes as well as um forecasting say the uk or various countries we've all also forecasted local authority forecasts so you can try and pick out where your region is here this is going back to july when things were fairly calm the more yellow the colour, the higher the forecast cases. And as we go through to November, you can see it's really darkening up again. And actually, by the time we get to January, it's really quite uh, running rampant, as we saw with the data uh, earlier. But now, actually, the colours are starting to uh, tail off again. So that's good news. So anyway, a forecast is any statement about the future. There's two basic methods of forecasting. You can either have a crystal ball that can see into the future, 
or you can extrapolate from present information. And unfortunately, there's never a crystal ball when you need one. So given that we can't use our crystal ball, we're going to have to extrapolate from present information. Now, forecast uncertainty is intrinsic. I've talked quite a bit about that distribution and how we measure forecast uncertainty, but there's two sources of uncertainty. One we know is present and understand the probabilities, and one is due to factors that we don't even know exist. So that first example, the known uncertainties, is the distribution, and we calculate the standard deviation in the distribution. The second, the factors that we don't even know exist, is the shifting distribution. And because of things we don't know that we don't know, the future is largely unpredictable. So a nice classic example is, say you've got two dice. You roll the dice, the probability that any pair of numbers will be face up. You can measure the probability of that. So it's uncertain what numbers will come up, but you can place a number on the uncertainty. But actually, if I told you then that the dice are loaded, that then knocks off your measure of uncertainty. And that's essentially what's going on in the economy. The dice are always loaded. So you'll have our latest economic forecast any minute. The governor is approaching the sheep's entrails at this very moment. So I've shown you some forecasts that we've done for COVID-19. What about forecasting macroeconomic data? So we might be interested in unemployment. Here's the UK annual unemployment rate, and it's going back to 1860. So I've got quite a long time span of the UK unemployment rate. So on the uh, Y axis, you can read this off as a percentage. So if we look at the first period, so from 1860 up to 1914, we've got large business cycles which are fluctuating around a fairly constant mean of about 5% roughly. Remember, this is a period when there was no unemployment benefit. So in periods when unemployment was up of, uh, to 10%, etc., this was pretty harsh on, on these individuals. But then we get the First World War, and that really brings unemployment down dramatically as everybody's employed in the war effort. Then we get the interwar period with high and variable unemployment. We get the post-First World War crash. We get the Great Depression. The UK abandoned the gold standard. This is a pretty poor time in terms of economics. So the best thing to do to get unemployment back down is have another war. So the Second World War brought unemployment right back down to uh, near zero again. But notice the different behavior after the Second World War compared compared to that after the First World War, we get post-war reconstruction, very low unemployment, very low variance, and this is due to the beverage reforms, the establishment of the NHS, social security, Keynesian policies, etc. But then we come into the 1970s, the oil crises and Thatcherism, um, and we get much higher and more variable unemployment before the UK exits the exchange rate mechanism in 92, which brings down unemployment again, followed by the financial crisis and a decade of low productivity. So you can see that the distribution of unemployment is shifting all over the place over this 150 odd year, 160 year period. So what is it going to do in 2020 facing the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, we computed some forecasts. Are there going to be jobs available? And the remarkable thing here in this top graph is that the economic model predicts unemployment to really dr rise dramatically. This is over the first half of last year. Our forecast predicted unemployment to stay fairly stable. Uh, that's the blue forecast down here. And in fact, unemployment did fa play, uh, stay fairly stable. And this is due to the furlough policies and um, government policies to try and maintain unemployment uh, down. Of course, as that unravels, we then anticipate un unemployment rising dramatically again. But it's currently uh, at about 5.1%, uh, which is much lower than all economic models would predict unless you account for these economic policies that have been implemented. So you can see how important forecasts are. Without those forecasts, we might not have had the economic policies to maintain low unemployment. So location shifts is the problem. COVID-19 is the latest example of large, unanticipated changes in economics. So let's go back to our analogy um, of this journey, this uh, journey to modelling that we're making. 
A forecast of a trip time based on distance and average speed, we're going to call that a causal model or a structural model. So we've got a, a good map. We're calculating how far we've got to go, what our average distance is, um, uh, sorry, our average speed is, and then we get a prediction. OK, now that works very well if you've got a good model and you get an accurate forecast if all these factors are known. But if you've got a poor model, an inaccurate map is going to give you poor forecasts. And if, for example, the map is suddenly incorrect, then these models can do very badly. That's exactly the same argument in economics. We can have great economic models. We think they're working really well, but then our forecasts can do very badly from these economic models. Let's try a different approach. Let's not even bother with these complicated economic models that we build that try and connect all the linkages in the economy. Let's just say that we'll look at the past behavior and just state that our forecast is the same as what the past behavior was. So in our car analogy, let's say you're going to go to Magdalen or your parents have been to Oxford um, a couple of years ago to have a nice look round. They know how long it took them. It took them two hours, 45 minutes. Therefore, their prediction of how long it'll take to get to Oxford is just two hours, 45 minutes. In other words, how long did it take last time? We'll just state that. Now, that extrapolation isn't very informative in terms of the economics, but it can actually be a very good forecast. It's a very simple time series model. We call it a random walk forecast. For example, the same argument would be, well, it rained yesterday, therefore I predict it's going to rain today. And those forecasts, although naive, can actually turn out to be very clever. And it's because in our economic models, we have an equilibrium. We've got a pin down equilibrium uh, that we base our forecasts on. The trouble is when that equilibrium shifts, our forecasts go badly wrong. And these simple models just extrapolate what you see today, don't have an equilibrium in them. And so they tend to do much better when shifts occur. So as I say here, parallel situations face economists when forecasting models that are inaccurate for the economy and their accuracy can change abruptly. So a good model of the economy is good for forecasting only if the future is close to the current outturn. OK, and as I tried to give you an example, uh, many examples, the future is never the same as the past. Many things come along and change it. So if the economy crashes, all forecasts miss. But these simple extrapolative forecasts can come back on track and do fairly well. Now, what are the forecasting methods that we can use? Well, to avoid systematic errors, um, that's what we want to do. We can adapt, um, but that doesn't provide knowledge of the future. It merely tracks, uh, merely, merely eliminates the tracking error. Think of uh, the alternative as using a sat nav in your car. Okay, that has that's using satellite navigation to predict that there's going to be congestion up ahead and therefore tells you in advance of hitting the congestion, oh, take a detour now. That's a really useful forecast because it enables you to change your behavior. So the analog in economics is to predict the changes. So that leaves us with two possibilities. The first is you avoid the pitfalls of forecasting or you avoid you you forecast them. So I'll start by avoiding the pitfalls and I'll give you a few tips um, to avoid the fit pitfalls before we look at how to forecast in economics. So here are two predictions that were made in 1936 in the New York Times. They stated a rocket will never be able to leave the Earth's atmosphere. Of course, 30 odd years later, here we are, Neil Armstrong on the moon. And then uh, Erasmus Wilson said, when the Paris exhibition of 1878 closes, electric light will close with it and no more will be heard of it. That's his prediction that we will never use electric light. So these are two pretty bad forecasts. So the first tip um, to avoid forecast failure, never be precise. Be as imprecise as possible about the magnitude and the timing of forecasts. And great seers knew about this need for imprecision, indeed, preferably ambiguity. So you may have come across the Oracle of Delphi. It's an early example of such uh, ambiguity. And the remarkable thing is that the Delphi method of forecasting is commonly used today, most notably by the current government. The second pitfall, always make more than one forecast. So let's say voting experts um, around the Brexit referendum said to one group of people, Remain will be victorious. And at another time and another place said to people, oh, the referendum outcome will be leave. 
Well, they wouldn't be castigated now. So the secret is tell different audiences different messages because some will later confirm that you were right. My third tip for avoiding pitfalls, never make unconditional statements such as there will be a third wave of COVID-19. Instead, always make it conditional on as many things as possible. So you've got to get out when it may or may not occur. For example, vaccines are rolled out quickly and effectively. Test and trace begins to work, although I think that may not be believable. Further rounds of lockdown will be imposed. COVID-19 evolves into a less acute respiratory syndrome. All of these qualifiers you can put on your forecasts. My next top tip, as Douglas Adams said, predicting the future is a mugs game, but any game is improved when you can keep the score. But our, my tip is to avoid keeping the score. Never allow for post-event evaluation unless you can claim success. And as Roosevelt famously said um, once, he wished to show that he had achieved his promises on a revisit during his re-election campaign. And his aide said to him, Mr. President, you must deny you have ever been here before. That's a top tip there. And then finally, to avoid the fifth pitfall, don't stand out from the crowd. Uh, the Golden Guru Award each year is awarded for the UK Misery Index. That's inflation, unemployment and economic growth. And Diane Coyle showed that forecasters herded together on these three measures and they usually won by only a very narrow margin, very few repeat winners. So don't stand out from the crowd. Always uh, stick to the crowd and you'll be uh, uh, avoiding forecast failure. So let me give you a, a, a quick game to try and illustrate this very naive device that I've tried to argue may actually be a fairly good forecasting uh, device. It's called the bus stop game. So Peter and Sue are sat at a bus stop and next to them, there's a girl sat there and Peter says to Sue, well, um, let's just pass the time by playing a forecasting game. Let's predict when this girl who's also sat at the bus stop will leave the uh, bus stop. And uh, every minute we'll make a prediction of whether this girl is here the next minute or not. And we'll see who wins. And so Peter decides to use a causal model. So he thinks, why do people get on buses uh, or why are people sat at bus stops to get on buses? So his plan is to forecast that this girl will leave the bus stop if he sees a bus coming around the corner and the girl will still be at the bus stop if he doesn't see a bus coming around the corner. Now, Sue thinks, oh, I, I don't really know how to forecast. I'm just going to use a random walk. In other words, if the girl is sat here, I'll say she's still sat here the next minute. And if the girl has left, I'll say she's left the next minute. So a simple random walk forecast. So they sit there and for the first minute, Peter sees a bus coming around the corner. So he predicts the girl will leave the bus stop. And Sue says, well, she's still sat at the bus stop, so I predict she'll stay. The bus comes along, doesn't stop, keeps going. And so Sue's won one and Peter's lost one. The next minute, another bus comes around the corner. Peter predicts that uh, the girl will leave the bus stop and Sue says she'll stay. And the bus was full, so it uh, didn't open its doors. And again, Peter lost and Sue won. The next minute, a motorbike comes along and picks up the girl and the girl goes away in the on the motor on the back of the motorbike. Now Peter was wrong and may is making systematic forecast errors because his forecasting model says that he will predict she only leaves if a bus is coming around the corner. Sue was wrong on one occasion. In other words, when the girl got on the motorbike, Sue was wrong. But after that, the girl is no longer there, so she's right systematically again. So actually, it's a really simple device, but you can see that actually using this random walk can help in economic forecasting. Now, that was to avoid the pitfalls. Can we forecast uh, big rare events? Well, um, it's extremely difficult, but there's some evidence that we can in other disciplines and therefore maybe we could in economics. So environmental rare events, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, there's some advanced sign of impending problems. And there's been quite a bit of progress in forecasting these sudden shifts, uh, both in volcanology and earthquake tectonics. So in some senses, economics is lagging, but we don't have good methods to forecast these shifts. But we have developed devices for forecasting during the shifts. Classic example now is, of course, the big recession due to COVID-19. We can forecast that trajectory. We can model the break trajectory and robust forecasting after the shifts using these simple devices that I've explained. 
So whereas the weather forecast has no effect on the weather, the economic forecast may often affect the economy. And this is what the crux of the problem in economics. There's this what we call endogeneity between the forecast and the actual outcome. So here's the example. You take your car to the garage and uh, you're a bit concerned about it. And the garage mechanic says, well, your brakes are about to fail. So you ask the driver, the mechanic to fix the brakes. And you drive off in your car with your new brake pads. But then the next day, you have to perform an emergency stop. You brake rapidly in response to another car pulling out in front of you. You don't go back to the garage the next day and say, why did you change my brakes? Tuesday's emergency stop was fine. And that's the problem. If you forecast a, a shift, then you're going to undertake policy to change it. And then your forecast will turn out to be wrong. So a classic example would be if the central bank predicted that there was going to be a recession, they might want to lower interest rates to avert that recession. And if they manage to do that successfully, then it looks like their forecast of predicting a recession is actually wrong, whereas in fact it helped them implement policy to avoid the recession. So if you take the two, two types of forecasting that we've talked about, first you fail to forecast some crises, they're just unpredictable. And then if you think about, well, we also avert some uh, crises that we do forecast because we implement policy. Put those two together and that's going to overwhelm the successful predictions that you can ever make. So it looks like economics, uh, are re economists are really bad at forecasting because of both of these events. So our best plan is to plan for constant change and the potential for instability and to recognise that the threats will constantly be changing in ways we cannot predict or fully understand. So we've come to the end of our journey and I thought it would be appropriate to end with a Maudlin alumnus, Oscar Wilde, to expect the unexpected shows a thoroughly modern in intellect. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. You can unmute or uh, or uh, what, put it in the chat or anything. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sally. That, that was absolutely brilliant. And um, uh, very current. <laughs> Uh, and fascinating um yeah so guys please do pop your questions in um the chat anything at all um based on what you've just heard um you know as Jane said you don't have to have an understanding of economics there's no silly questions um and equally any questions you'd like to know more generally about studying uh, economics or ppe um or studying at oxford Brilliant. So our first question is, are there any books you suggest for us to read? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there's a huge number of books out there. I'm not sure I could list uh, everything. But what I would say is try and read uh, books that you're really interested in and show um, um, just a, an inquiring mind about economics. Um, economics has been one of these disciplines that's just had an explosion of popular economics books. So they're non-technical. Um, I'm thinking of books, um, for example, by Tim Harford, um, um, Avinash Dixit. Um, oh, gosh, there's lots, actually. Uh, Martin Wolf, um, all of these kind of people. I think if you have a look on the uh, economics website, uh, department website as well, they list a number of good uh, books to read. The other thing I'll suggest is reading current newspapers. So read the Financial Times, read The Economist. Um, I also say read Private Eye because that gives you a good insight into <laughs> what's going on in the world as well. Um, so. Um, I think, yeah, one of my favourites is uh, Tim Harford. I think he's a great columnist and he, he manages to relate economics to the real world. Um, there's a lot of probably what you're doing in your A-levels is quite theory based. And I think you really want to think about how economics maps to the real world. So that's why looking at data, uh, Andrew Dillnut is another um, interesting person to read. Um, Michael Blasland. In fact, there's lots of um, Radio 4 podcasts as well on economics that you could also um, read up on as well. So I'm not going to give you one one um, book to read that will you know, give you the answers to all of economics, but I would say just to have an inquiring mind and anything that engages you in economics will, will stand you in really good stead for the subject. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just to reiterate what Jenny's saying there, when it comes um, to uh, applying and wanting to make sure you're sort of doing things in preparation, really what all subjects want to see, not not just um, PPE, is that you start where you're interested. Um, so I've made a note of the, some of the names that Jenny suggested. And like she said, she's absolutely right on the, the website. There'll be other suggested reading uh, and I can put them in an email to you afterwards. But yeah, really do start with what you're interested in. Don't force yourself through things that... Um, that are interesting not not uh, something you're you're into really um, and it doesn't have to be reading it can be podcasts it can be documentaries um, it can be uh, anything that is exploring the subject outside of school absolutely there's um, another just a, yeah, one yeah. other book um, um, the armchair economist I can't I think it's Landsberg um, that's really nice because that's more micro because I, I, I've talked more about macro and you know real world and stuff but if you're into microeconomics that's a lot lovely way of seeing how applications of micro theory can be played out in the real world as well. Brilliant, thank you. We're getting some fantastic questions through guys, um, thank you. So um, we've had another one saying uh, how to define uh, economic welfare, question mark, just how to define. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is a in huge debate at the moment. I'd suggest you read quite a bit about what Diane Coyle's working on. Um, so there's a big tension of course the standard measure that we think about is gdp um and historically post second world war it's been a fairly reasonable measure because it kind of measures what the output of an economy is but there's more and more recognition that it's just not fit for purpose because actually it, it's not able to measure what we really interested in which is this general undefined concept of economic welfare. Um, it doesn't capture um, environmental concerns, climate change concerns. It's very hard to put prices on non-market goods. So, for example, you, you may have seen in the news about this differences between the UK and other European countries about how we measure the output of the NHS. And that's why during COVID, the UK looks like it's suffering a much bigger recession than in uh, other European countries. So, um, I mean, that's a slightly technical aspect, but GDP is really hard to measure in a very highly service based economy. The question is what you replace it with. There's quite a few people have been pushing for this sort of measure of happiness economics, but that's so subjective, it's not going to get us very far. We don't have a good answer yet. So I would encourage um, all your students to, to take economics as a degree and work on this and come up with the answers in the future, because it's clear that GDP needs to go. We need a better measure, probably a multidimensional measure of welfare that incorporates um, inequality, um, measures of wealth and income, measures of our depletion of resources and climate change, um, all of these kind of things. Um, so economists need to put their thinking caps on and work very hard on that. So um, study economics and come up with the answers. Yeah, fantastic. That's a challenge for you guys. <laughs> um, OK, next question. Uh, if economic forecasts are so difficult to make and potentially inaccurate and consequently harmful, are we better off without them? It would be impossible uh, to work without forecasts, I'm afraid. Um, uh, you have to make forecasts. How would you make uh, interest rate decisions? Because interest rates impact on outcomes two years down the line. So you need to know, have some idea of what um, inflation and output will be two years down the line in order to set interest rates today. So unfortunately forecasts are unavoidable but what we do need to do is communicate the fact that we um that there's a huge amount of uncertainty on the forecasts uh so that's one aspect and the second aspect is not to make systematic mistakes okay so i think it's fair enough that all economists didn't predict covid19 uh you know it there was no one in um uh, you know, October 2019 saying the UK is going to be in a massive recession in tw October 2020. And we wouldn't hold economists, uh, you know, to say, well, what a poor, a poor job they did. But what's important is that they don't carry on making these forecasting mistakes. So once you see COVID-19 has hit, then you've got to say, OK, what's the implication going to be on GDP? Update it. And if you make a mistake when it the shock uh, hits because it's unanticipated, fair enough, don't systematically make forecasting mistakes, which we actually still, I'm afraid, see. I mean, if you look at the um, 
Office for Budget Responsibility, their forecasts for productivity, you'll see they made a decade of systematic forecast mistakes. Those are the kind of things we need to avoid. Mm, brilliant, thank you. Uh, so our next question is, what are the uses and limitations of economic data? Um, well, <laughs> that's an enormous question. <laughs> um, economic data is absolutely fundamental because you can sit in a sort of high uh, ivory tower developing economic theories, but unless they represent reality, what's the point of them? OK, so um, you need to be able to map your economic theory to the real world. And the only way to do that is to use economic data. So it's absolutely essential. The limitations are that it's extremely hard to measure, not just GDP, as we've mentioned, but any form of economic data is really hard to measure. So it's got measurement error, it's revised, it's often wrong, um, and we have to work with that. Um, but uh, that's the best we can do, but it's really essential to work with it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so uh, we've had, uh, uh, I, I like this question, uh, how can literature contribute to the study of economics? Oh, how can literature? OK. Um, um, they, have, they have prefaced it with this is pretty tangential. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing this is someone who's taking A level English literature and is wondering whether that will feed into uh, PPE. Um, so, I mean, there's a huge number of soft skills as well as hard skills that are required in studying any degree. If you think about what politics, philosophy and economics, that's the degree that we offer, requires, you need to be technically adept. There's quite a lot of mathematics and statistics that we use in economics, but you also need to be very adept at processing large amounts of uh, information, reading uh, quite complicated um, articles, condensing that down, drawing out the key points and presenting your arguments. Um, you, need, you need to be quite good at debating and sort of putting forward your arguments, critiquing others' arguments, because in economics, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, there are people on many different sides of the argument. And so um, I think eco uh, literature, uh, sort of that sort of um, critiquing and that that kind of analysis um, skill set that you probably build with uh, with doing a de um, subjects in literature might well uh, stand you in good stead in economics. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. I will just um, add to that. We have um, students that take our PPE degree come with a vast array of different A-levels and indeed not just A-levels, but, you know, the baccalaureate or various other degrees. Uh, so, you know, um, um, school grades. So um, the subjects themselves aren't really fundamental. Um, uh, well, the only thing that, that's, uh, it's not a requirement, the only thing that helps is uh, maths A-level. Uh, but other than that, you know, anything, um, as long as you're interested in it, is, is, is good. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so our next question, we've got absolutely loads, which is fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, what are the advantages of a free market economy? <laughs> Again, I don't want to write your essays for you. <laughs> uh, what are the advantages of a free market economy? Well, um, there it's welfare improving under a free market economy under most conditions. Um, so uh, I guess all I would say there is um, look at the growth rates for countries after they open up to international trade. International trade has really uh, generated huge improvements in growth. There's a debate to be had over improvements in or not having improvements in equality or inequality. Um, but in general, in terms of uh, economic welfare, coming back to our previous question, international trade or free market economics um, is really uh, um, very um, important. Um, yeah, I, I think that's just such a big topic. If you want to compare <laughs> to sort of command uh, economy versus free market economy, I say go and read the literature and maybe that's something we can talk about in uh, tutorials to come. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've had another question saying what type of economic modelling would you say is a great starting point to learn from, e.g. linear regression or normal distribution? 
OK, so we're talking about the basics of econometrics here, uh, how to take the data and manipulate it to try and understand what's going on in the economy. And the basic the, the sort of um, workhorse of economists is the linear regression model. So in other words, that's saying um, you are trying to correlate different concepts, for example, inflation and unemployment. And you want to think about how these two types of data uh, connect to each other. The big issue we have in economics is being able to say whether uh, there's a relationship that's causal or just a correlation. That's fundamental. And so in econometrics, we have some roots which are really trying to identify causal relationships. And there's a big field in economics now of randomized controlled trials. Um, so that's essentially taking, you know, the the top notch um, methodology in um, uh, medical sciences and applying it to economics. So you go out into the field and you set up a little randomized controlled trial and then you can test for causality. Much harder to do that with big aggregate data like inflation and unemployment. So we use linear regression, but then we need to try and tease out whether we can say something is causal or whether it's just a relationship that correlates at a given point in time. Time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so how does philosophy link with economics? Oh, that's a nice question. We spend a lot of time, actually, the PPE tutors all getting together, thinking about how to connect up the three subjects. If we go back to, I think, um, PPE started in Oxford in 1920. So if we go back 100 years, it was basically um, political economy, which is a branch of philosophy. Um, so it was uh, economics was very much based on the fundamental principles of philosophy. If you roll forward 100 years, it's gotten a bit more technical. Uh, and so much of what we do now is trying to uh, be a bit more rigorous about the underlying theory. Um, having said that, the principles of philosophy still feed into all of our economic models. So there's a, an awful lot that maps over and not just in philosophy, but with politics as well. And so, you know, we can discuss, say, books like Thomas Piketty's um, book on inequality that covers philosophy, politics and economics. It's basically thinking, how do you want the world to look um, and how can we how, how would you like the world to look? That's the philosophy. What institutions can we put in place to get that world looking like that? That's the polo uh, politics. And how can we set up the economic systems to give us that kind of world? So they're all so interconnected. PPE is the perfect degree for it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so how uh, would you predict future output when the rate of advancements in technology is so high and quite unpredictable? We know that better tech equals more efficient workers equals more output. Yeah, so this is something that we've been uh, coming back to this measure of GDP. It's just impossible to measure uh, improvements in um, um, technology that doesn't have a price on it. And in fact, not only is it hard to measure it, it's hard to tax it as well. So actually you see the tax base falling. Um, so in other words, um, uh, how, how do we measure vast improvements in things like social media? Um, these are questions that really perplex economists. If you look at the data on productivity, it's stagnated over the last 10, 12 years since the financial crisis. But there's a sense that actually we're measuring the wrong thing because there's been a huge amount of innovation going on as well. The question is, how do you measure whether the innovation is productive or non productive and whether this innovation is um, is generating what we call creative destruction. In other words, new ideas are, are getting rid of obsolete businesses and generating um, new ways of thinking. Another field um, that economists are thinking a lot about is how um, um, artificial intelligence um, is going to play into uh, things in the future, particularly in terms of employment. Is it augmenting high skilled labour or is it augmenting low skilled labour? Is it a complement or a substitute for those? All of these questions are really big topical questions that economists are putting their mind to at the moment. So again, something to encourage you guys to come and, and study economics, because these are going to be the questions that are facing us for the next decade or two. Brilliant. 
Thank you. Um, so this is a, a rather long question, uh, but so it's uh, or several questions maybe. Uh, I find it very interesting that you're currently forecasting COVID data, something wonderfully worthwhile. What has been your greatest difficulty thus far, and what has been the greatest economic theory or technology development that has facilitated this compared to say five years ago? Oh wow. Okay. Um, so the. So the greatest difficulty and what's been the greatest advancement? Is that the theory or technological development that's facilitated this? Um... Yeah. So actually, the reason we got into it is um, we've been part uh, participating in um, some international economic forecasting competitions who knew these existed um, <laughs> a bit like you know uh, chess competitions um, where um, there's a an organizer who he set up um, a competition where we had to forecast 100,000 different time series and people from all over the world could compete. In fact, um, the winner was a guy who worked at Uber um, and he had access to enormous amounts of computer power and did some very fancy technology and uh, it was really impressive forecasts. But anyway, so uh, economists uh, get quite excited by these forecasting competitions and we spent quite a bit of time designing our forecasts to try and work well on economic data and then the pandemic came along and of course the natural question was how well do our forecasting devices work on this extremely different time series data and you saw the data of covid you know these periods when you've got big exponential growth you don't see that in economics other than in say hyperinflations which we haven't seen for a while um so we were keen to try them out so i think um the, the the useful theory or advance was this uh, this process of going through these forecasting competitions in advance um the hardest thing about it has been to convince the epidemiological um uh, scientists that actually economists can contribute something to statistical analysis now uh, going back to the analogy that i made in in the slides um their models are the theory models right they've got a good uh, measure of what the rate of transmission is um, um the rate of recovery all of this is very complicated um epidemiological modeling we're just coming at it from a right a statistical perspective so that's essentially the random walk forecast kind of thing that i was talking about and so it's been hard to convince people in other disciplines that actually um our forecasts are doing fairly well but uh, the the key thing is they they speak for themselves you have to evaluate them and in some periods we do extremely well some periods we do less well and we can explain why that is when the epidemiological models really matter and in fact the best thing to do is average the two of them and you end up with a pretty good forecast mm, brilliant thank you um and okay i'm sorry i realize i haven't got to everyone's question um but um, i've tried to make sure different people have different questions answered um so as someone else asked if you don't have the right or enough data to forecast something what would be the best way to avoid making a mistake when forecasting ah well you still need to do something um uh in fact we're very lucky in the uk because we have very long time spans of data as i showed you the unemployment data runs from 1860. now um i was doing some work for the kenyan central bank and their time series data was about three years long uh, and they said right you know uh, show, show us your forecast and not only was it really short data but it was also all over the place um, but you still need to do something so um, a lot of judgment is involved in, in those kind of situations so you use the same methods but you, you have to then incorporate your judgment your understanding about the institutions and what's been going on um, yeah all of these things matter when uh, producing forecasts, but it still needs to be done. I think the, the top tip is collecting data is really important. And we've seen that in COVID-19. Um, you know, we need to collect as much quality data on everything in order to inform um, policy decisions down the line. Brilliant, brilliant. And I thought I'd just briefly uh, touch on, um, so hopefully you guys will go on to study um, this in in some form somewhere but just sort of speaking specifically about at Oxford and how we teach in terms of tutorials uh, how are you working with your sort of first years in tutorials what are you working on and how does a tutorial work in um, in economics 
Okay, so in economics in the first year, um, the students take three separate papers, as it were, uh, which is assessed as one, uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and um, quantitative, or I think they call it probability and statistics, just to give you some maths background. Um, I teach them the macro and the probability and statistics, uh, and my colleague Tom teaches the micro. We tend to meet in tutorial pairs, so two students to one tutor. They've been set um, an essay or a problem set to do in the week before. They attend the lectures, do the problem set, submit it to the tutor, to me. I'll mark it and send it back to them before our, our tutor tutorial. And then we meet up, the three of us, and then we'll go through the problem set or the essay, talking about how it can be improved or where they went wrong or what kind of things we can do to uh, to improve the work. And um, we'll do that um, throughout a term. We have some classes for the more mathematical topics. Um, we tend to meet in a bigger group of um, either four or in some cases we meet the whole tutorial group of about eight or nine. Um, and then... Um, and the topics are very varied, um, but it covers a whole range throughout economics. And that's the first year course. And then in the second and third year, um, students can select to more um, to to um, areas of economics that interest them more. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, well, we have reached the end of our time. Thank you all so much for your questions. Um, uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask um, more broadly, maybe to some students studying PPA or studying other subjects at Oxford, if you go onto the Magdalen College website, there's a chat to students function. You'll be able to go on, uh, see some of their profiles and, and choose who you drop a message to and they'll get back to you um, shortly. You're also welcome to email me um, uh, with any questions uh, you have more broadly about Oxford or studying here, etc. Um, but thank you so much for coming and thank you so much to Jenny for such a wonderful um, lecture and, and for giving your time to questions, etc. It, it was really great. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you very Thanks. much. Bye. Bye. Bye.